ಯಸ್ತ್ಯಪಮ್ಯಂ ಪ್ರಭವತಿ ಜಗತ ಅನೇಕಧಾನುಗ್ರಹ ಪ್ರಕ್ಷೀಣ ಕ್ಲೇಶರಾಶಿ ವಿಷಮ ವಿಷಧರ ಅನೇಕ ವಕ್ತ್ರ ಸುಭೋಗೀ ಸರ್ವಜ್ಞಾನ ಪ್ರಸೂತಿ ಭೋಜಗ ಪರಿಕರ ಪ್ರೀತೇಷ ಸವೋವ್ಯಾತ್ ಸಿತ ವಿಮಲತನು ಯೋಗದೋ ಯೋಗಯುಕ್ತ ಯೋಗೀನ ಚಿತ್ತ ಪದೇನ ವಾಚ ಮಲಂ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯಕೇನ ಯೋಪಾಕರೋತ್ತ ಪ್ರವರ ಮುನೀನ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಂಜಲಿರಾನತೋಸ್ಮಿ ಆಹುಪುರುಷಾಕಾರ ಶಂಖಚಕ್ರಸಿ ಧಾರಿಣ ಸಹಸ್ರಶಿರಸ ಶ್ವೇತ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಅನಂತ ನಾಗರಾಜಾ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಪಾತಂಜಲ ಮಹಾಭಾಷ್ಯ ಚರಕ ಪ್ರತಿ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತ ಮನೋವಾಖಾಯೋಷಾ ಹರ್ತ್ರೇ ಅಹಿ ಪತೇ ನಮಃ ಸೊ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ವೀಕ್ ವಿ ಕನ್ಕ್ಲೂಡೆಡ್ ದ ಸೂತ್ರಾಸ್ ಆನ್ ನಿದ್ರಾ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸ್ಮೃತಿ ದೇರ್ ಫೋರ್ ವಿ ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟ್ ದ ಸೈಕಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸೂತ್ರಾಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದ ಚಿತ್ತ ವೃತ್ತೀಸ್ ಸೊ ಇನ್ ದ ಸೂತ್ರ of the definition of yoga patanjali says yoga ha chitta vritti nirodha ha and therefore he is explaining what is chitta vrittis so that we are clear and these are the few sutras that we have talked about and now he is describing to us how we can reach the state of nirodha <coughs> the next goal is next goal of patanjali is okay you have understood what are the chitta vrittis how to reach the state of yoga which is defined as chitta vritti nirodaha nirodaha state so therefore he presents the sutra abhyasa vairagya abhyam tan nirodaha tan nirodaha then there is nirodha how abhyasa vairagya abhyam he says there are two fundamental requirements to reach the state of chitta vritti nirodha one is called abhyasam and one is called vairagyam abhyasam may be very loosely translated as practice vairagyam is defined as detachment or letting go of certain things now both are essential in modern times some people they practice a lot but there is not the detachment 
In some other cases, there are people who are very detached from different things, but they are not practicing. One of them is not enough. That is why the grammatical samasa that Patanjali is used, dvandva samasa, abhyasa, vairagya, bhyam, which means abhyasa and vairagyam. When my teacher used to explain these concepts, he ex used to explain it like a metaphor of a bird that has to fly. Now, when a bird wants to fly, it needs both wings. It cannot fly with only one wing. A bird needs both wings so that it can fly. If it has only one wing, perhaps it will only go around in circles. It will not go straight. So it's like that. We need to have abhyasam and vairagyam together so that we are moving forward, moving closer to chitta vritti nirodha. So let us try to understand what these are meaning, abhyasam and vairagyam. Patanjali will define them himself. But what are the word themselves meaning? <clears throat> there are many meanings for the word abhyasa. Abhyasa can be literally defined as practice. <coughs> but what is the meaning of practice? What is it implying? One of the definitions of Abhyasa is Guru Upadishya Margaha Abhyasaha. The path that is defined by the teacher for us, that is Abhyasa. That is what we should practice. Each of us are different. Our gunas are different. Our prakriti is different. Our age is different. Our capacities are different. Therefore, one method will not work for everybody. So, a teacher, <clears throat> an acharya who is in connection with us can make an evaluation of us and say, okay, this person has these uh, strengths, this person has these weaknesses. In order for this person to make the strengths more stronger and reduce the weakness so that they can go forward, these kind of practices may be helpful for this person. For the another person, person number two, these are the strengths, these are the weaknesses. For such a person number two, this kind of practice is helpful, this kind of practice is not helpful. Therefore, another set of practices are given. Goals may be different for people. Somebody may want to reach Chitta Vritti Nirodha, in a one particular field, somebody else may want to achieve Chitta Vritti Nirodha in another particular kind of field. So therefore, the practices are different. That's why in the old days, they always used to say, self-practice is not really the best way. Just like in modern times, we are saying self-medication can be dangerous, where you just go to the pharmacy and buy what you want and eat it. It's not going to help you. Self-medication can actually create problems. The same way, <clears throat> practicing on your own, whatever you want, yatheshta abhyasa, that's how Krishnamacharya says, practice of doing whatever you want, it is not going to be healthy. <coughs> you may like some things, you may dislike some things. So if you just practice what you like and don't practice what you don't like, it may not be appropriate. What is appropriate may not be something that you like. And what is not appropriate may be something that you like very much. <clears throat> Sometimes the Ayurvedic doctors, they use this theory. They say, what is tasty in your tongue is not good for your body. What is not so tasty in the tongue is usually healthy for your body. That's why many Ayurvedic medicines, they don't really taste so nice. They are horrible to taste usually, but they are usually much healthier. Whereas certain things which are tasting very nice, like sugar, Especially in a nation like India where diabetes is so common, sugar is poisonous, but it tastes so nice in the tongue. The same way, with practice also, we can't just do what we want. What is appropriate? That is where the discernment of a teacher who is a little bit more wiser than us usually comes into play so that he or she can evaluate what is beneficial for us, what is not, and give us this method of practice. And that is what is called 
ಅಭ್ಯಾಸ ಗುರು ಉಪದೇಶ್ಯ ಮಾರ್ಗ ಅಭ್ಯಾಸ ಬಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಎನ್ ಅದರ್ ಡೆಫಿನೇಷನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಅಭ್ಯಾಸ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಬೇಸಿಕ್ಲಿ ಅಭಿಮುಖೇನ ಆಸ ಅಭ್ಯಾಸ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅಭ್ಯಾಸ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅನ್ ಇಂಟಿಮೇಟ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಅಸ್ ಸಿ ವಿ ಕೆನ್ ಡೂ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟೀಸ್ from a, a superficial level we can do just raise arms lower arms raise arms lower arms we do it in an unconscious manner a lot of people today do that watching tv uh, they do it watching uh, cinema they they do mantra japa when they are driving the motorcycle because it becomes very unconscious it's not really coming from a deep place inside whereas <clears throat> the definition of abhyasa is abhimukhena asaha the practice comes from a deep place in your heart abhimukham means from the heart that means you are conscious in your practice you are very very conscious in your practice and uh, we are not doing it necessarily only from the body but we are doing it from a deep place inside so you have a, what is called a heart connection with the practice so whether you are doing asana or whether you are doing pranayama or whether you are doing mantra japa it has to come from a place of deep inside it should resonate in our heart very deeply from there we do the practice because remember i go back to the word chitta the word chitta is heart mind it's not just the mind that is in the brain it is a heart mind the mind that is close to the heart so practice also must be something that comes from such a place where we are doing it from a very deep place in our heart and it is not superficial if we do practice from a superficial place we will only get superficial benefits perhaps you do some gym exercises or some asanas in a physical manner <coughs> unconsciously well you may achieve maybe muscular development maybe your muscles become strong superficial at the body level but your mind does not get refined your heart does not get refined your prana does not get refined the subtle things are not refined and that is why they say practice must be coming from the subtle place in us so practice is that which comes from the subtle place yeah, that is in our system we can call this anandamaya we can call this our heart system heart structure we can call it even the vijnanamaya that is also very subtle so practice must essentially come from within <coughs> this raises other questions even though we say teacher gives us the practice so we can always argue if teacher gives practice that means it's coming from an outside place no even if it's coming from an outside person like a teacher the practice must be accepted by us from the heart we must do it with faith and that is what becomes the practice we can't blindly follow what the teacher says just because he says we intellectually say oh teacher has said i will not do any do anything different it has to also feel right inside you and usually this happens when there is a good teacher who is wise and there is also a good connection between the teacher and the student it will not happen when these two are not there so this is another definition of <coughs> abhyasa krishnamacharya says that because we are talking about chitta vritti nirodha and the goal of yoga is to take us towards kaivalyam another abhyasa we have to do is a manasika abhyasa purusha prakriti bhinna ha he says what is what is going to liberate us from suffering through the point of view of the yoga school and the sankhya school is the confusion between what is matter and what is the spirit what is purusha what is prakriti there is a confusion we don't know what is purusha we don't know what is prakriti we are sometimes mixing the two and we are functioning so what krishnamacharya says is there must also be a manasika abhyasa we have to keep reminding ourselves purusha and prakriti are different they are not the same and we have to constantly practice this reminder that they are not the same because it's very easy for us to get sucked into the material world and the more we are drawn into the material world 
we are further away from the spiritual path and that is why we are further away from chitta vritti nirodha chitta vritti nirodha is something that is closer to <coughs> what is called the spiritual path whereas the prakriti path the material path takes us further away from this patanjali later in the fourth chapter talks about this that vyasa also agrees and highlights the same idea that acharya krishna macharya has said tada viveka nimnam kaivalya prag bharam chittam <coughs> when the mind is linked to the spirit <coughs> it moves closer towards kaivalyam freedom and vyasa presents the opposite as well he says same way when the mind is closer to matter it moves further away from kaivalyam which means it moves further away from it moves closer to dukkham further away from the feeling of freedom so when we are attached to material objects we are going more towards suffering than towards freedom that's why the abhyasa that krishna macharya says is purusha and prakriti are different we have to be more connected to purusha we have to not be connected to attached to prakriti <clears throat> and this way we have to remind ourselves again and again and that becomes a mental abhyasa manasika abhyasa what he calls manasika abhyasa means it's a mental exercise we have to repeat this again and again in our mind it's they are different i should not be attached to puru prakriti i should be more connected to purusha the moment we start doing that you will see that you will go closer and closer to the heart and therefore whatever you do including practices <coughs> will also become much more refined because it will come from a place of the heart similarly shankara says in the commentary on the yoga sutra that abhyasa means yama niyama sahita ashtanga yoga sadhanani he says that abhyasa here refers to the ashtanga yoga that is presented by patanjali which includes yama niyama and the others patanjali says in the second chapter that when we have to do certain practices to which takes us closer to the state of kaivalyam the state of viveka he says we need to put into place eight different practices not all of these are physical practices some of them are attitudes only such as yama and niyama yama represents our attitude usually towards other people social attitudes are we friendly to ourselves and to others ahimsa we should not be violent to ourselves to others satyam we must be truthful to ourselves and the others brahmacharya we must be faithful loyal fidelity asteyam we must not steal we must not take what belongs to another aparigraha we must not be grasping in nature sometimes we are very grasping in nature we are grasping of our friends we are grasping of things we are grasping of attention this is what is called parigraha but patanjali presents the opposite aparigraha as the yama so <clears throat> yama is some practices of behavior social behavior that we must put into place this is also an abhyasa it's not just standing on the head or doing head stand shoulder stand etc that is abhyasa yama is also an abhyasa same way niyama shaucham we have to be clean in the body level and in the mind level we have to have clean thoughts we have to have positive thoughts we have to keep our body clean body healthy this is shaucham santosham we have to practice contentment we have to be happy with what we have if we are always looking at what we don't have then this is not contentment sometimes we are always looking for the person who is not there and we are ignoring the person who is there <coughs> it's very typical in indian marriages where you invite family and friends to indian marriage sometimes there will be 2000 people 3000 people who will come to attend your marriage 
or your family's marriage maybe if three or four people do not come the whole talk of the families will be why these persons did not come the talk will not be about why the persons who are there are there and not be happy about it we are always being unhappy with what we don't have and not being grateful for what we have patanjali says that is also a practice practice being happy with what you have because what you don't have you cannot control you cannot influence you can only influence and be happy with what you have so in this way he is teaching us the practice of santosha that is also an abhyasa then comes tapas detoxifying our body mind and speech sometimes we have certain toxins in the body because we are not perfect nobody is perfect we have some defects sometimes it's body defects sometimes it's emotional defects sometimes it's defects in language or speech always try to improve yourself <clears throat> because you are not perfect you will not be so easily perfect try to improve yourself that is tapas swadhyaya <clears throat> do also practice of self enquiry self reflection ask yourself questions why you are behaving the way you are behaving why you are not behaving in a different way who you are what are your responsibilities what are your <clears throat> uh, rights what are your duties towards yourself towards others ask your ask yourself this question which is basically what is called as swadhyaya self enquiry then ishwara pranidana <clears throat> as practice a relationship with the divine because we are all not the masters of this world there are other attributes other things that is influencing us so practice a relationship with the divine consciousness you can call it god you can call it nature there are so many things that control this universe which are not in our control evaluate that relationship what is the relationship you have this is part of the practice as well then only he talks about asana it talk, talks about doing certain body positions body exercises so that the body is influenced in certain ways in a positive manner we change the samskaras the patterns that are in the body then he talks about pranayama which is basically <clears throat> using certain conscious methods to regulate the breathing and he says that is also part of your practice you also have to regulate your breathing because as long as you have breathing you are alive so if you want to extend your life please extend your breath the more you extend your breath the more you will extend your life and the more vitality you will have in your life as well so this is also another part of practice then he also includes practice sensory discipline called pratyahara <clears throat> our senses are capable of doing many things they can see smell hear touch etc taste etc but what do you want to see <clears throat> there are so many things in this world what do you want to see sometimes we are not even seeing an object completely we are so distracted our senses are getting distracted from one to the other what do you want to see you have to make a choice therefore you have to learn to control the senses so that you are able to use them to perceive what is it that you want to see in a correct way because sense is called a grahana that which can hold something the eyes can hold a form of the object the ears can hold the form of a sound the tongue can hold the form of a taste you know the taste of garlic and onion different from that of potato why because the tongue holds that taste same way smell the nostrils can hold the smell of different things how are you going to use them are you going to use them in a distracted manner or are you going to use them in a manner that is focused because when we are doing one activity the senses are not shut off they are also still working you can get distracted by them if the senses are not disciplined and therefore your skill in doing the action that you are supposed to do that is influenced in a negative manner 
So he says, please use the senses in a good way. Practice how to utilize the senses in an appropriate manner. The ancient yogis were so skillful in this, they could say so much by using the senses in an appropriate manner. So that is pratyahara, that is also part of abhyasa. Then comes dharana, dhyanam, samadhi, the three <coughs> practices which are called antaranga sadhanas, which are basically the ability to concentrate on something, dharana, meditation, dhyanam, and full integration that is called samadhi. These are further tools of yoga that are presented where the mind is extending its capacity to engage with a focus at a much deeper level and therefore <coughs> have the possibility for chitta vritti nirodha. Dharana, dhyanam and samadhi already are what we call as chitta vritti nirodha, the state of yoga. So on the one hand, some people say, like Shankara, they say that abhyasa refers to the ashtanga yoga sadhanas. But certain acharyas, especially coming from the south, the Dravidian culture, who are belonging to the tradition of Natha Muni and other yogis, they say abhyasa is shadanga yoga abhyasa. The yoga practice of the six limbs. In the south India especially, there is a school of yoga that is called as prapatti yoga, the yoga of surrender. There the yoga is more devotional in nature and they say that you have to surrender to the divine. And you have to do every action as if it is an action done to the divine. Whether you are doing an asana, you are doing an asana as if the asana is practiced <coughs> in such a manner that it is a service towards the divine. You do pranayama, you are doing pranayama as if it is a service towards the divine. So they bring this concept and that is called prapatti yoga. In Prapatti Yoga, there are six Sanghas. So, some of these Acharyas, they say, Abhyasa refers to the Shadanga Yoga. What are the six Sanghas of Shadanga Yoga? Anukulyasya Sankalpaha, Pratikulyasya Varjanam, Rakshishyati Iti Vishwasa, Goktrupta Varanam Tata, Atma Nikshepaha Karpanyam. Six, six steps are there. The first is anukulyasya sankalpaha. Sankalpa means you take a commitment. You take a vow that whatever actions you are doing, it will only be towards the direction of reaching the divine. Anukulam. Anukulam. In Tamil we use the word anukulam. Very convenient. So a little bit of abuse of the word anukula because actually the word anukula does not literally mean it is convenient to us. What is convenient to us is we sit in front of the TV and eat some chips and watch cricket match. But what it means actually Anukula is that it is convenient to the Lord. It is convenient to the divine. Whatever actions I do, it is consistent with the divine, convenient to the divine, not for me, not for you and I. Pratikulyasya Varjanam, everything else I give up. I do not do anything that will take me away from the divine. Rakshishyati iti Vishwasaha, Vedanta Deshika in the Nyasa Vimshati calls this Maha Vishwasam, a great, great faith that you will be protected. You have to practice again and again, Manasika Sankalpa again and again that. God will protect me. I will be protected. It doesn't matter what happens. I will be protected. This is what we call Maha Vishwas or Great Shraddha. Goptruptva Varanam Tatha. Goptruptva Varanam means to recite the name of God again and again. You are doing Mantra Japa or you are doing Stotras or Shlokas. You are doing what is called <coughs> Kalakshepam, you are doing so many different things where you are repeating the praises on the divine, saying, okay, the divine will take care of us, the divine will protect us, the divine is so great. 
what we call vaibhavam we are doing we are glorifying the divine this is a reminder the, the mind when you do that it's not just to surrender to god and this and that when you do that the mind gets into a state of positive vibrations i spoke about it last week we talked about memory and i said to you what is memory and what is memory the connection between memory and dhyanam in our language of sanskrit smriti and dhyanam are synonyms that is why sometimes they are used interchangeably for example instead of saying i meditate on baby krishna they say i remember baby krishna balam mukundam manasa smarami smarami means i remember It's meditation whatever you remember whatever you meditate that's what you will become so if you meditate on the paramatma with positive attributes through this process of mantra or madhyanam etc the mind becomes holds only positive attributes therefore you become positive the negatives are automatically removed sometimes you are working very hard to remove the negatives instead of that these people are saying just practice the positive don't worry about the negatives automatically the negatives will disappear there is a verse in sanskrit which is called prabalena durbalasya badaha when something is strong something else becomes weak when the positive is strong the negative is weak when the negative is strong positive is weak so don't hold on to negatives hold on to positives atma nikshepa and karpanya atma nikshepa means you have to surrender your atma to the divine your ego must be surrendered to the paramatma this establish what is called the the relationship between our atma and paramatma jeevatma paramatma sambandha we are subservient to the divine the attitude that we are not great that paramatma is great we are not so great there is something else higher that is greater this we have to practice atma nikshepa at the same time karpanyam karpanyam is related somehow to the word kripa as well we have to be compassionate to the others we have to be humble to the others sometimes we can have the attitude we have surrendered to god so we are so great others who have not surrendered they are not so great we can be more arrogant with other people that also you should not have you must have the concept of humility karpanyam you must have the concept of being bit more kind being a bit compassionate towards other people so all these are called shadanga and this is what some acharyas are saying abhyasa should be the practice of shadanga yoga that is what will take you towards chitta vritti nirodha because when you practice shadanga yoga you are closer to the divine and therefore you get the divine attributes and the divine attribute is that which is paramatma is stable so your mind will also become stable and that is what is chitta vritti nirodha so that is how they define abhyasa but then we don't have only abhyasa to worry about we also have to worry about vairagyam vairagyam has many dimensions the word vairagyam comes from vigataha ragaha vairagyam we have to give up the desire vairagyam is not just to not do something but desire for it for example there are many diabetic people who are asked not to eat sweets who are not to asked to eat ice cream but they still have the desire to eat so they will buy the what is called the non sugar sweet non sugar ice cream because the desire is there now that is not vairagyam that may help the diabetes but it is not going to help chitta vritti nirodha because vairagyam is the desire itself should not be there now this has many different dimensions to consider because when we engage in a spiritual path vairagyam is very necessary when you have to reach any goal you have to give up everything that is distracting so there may be so many things that are distracting us and we have to detach ourselves from all the distractions like i shared a couple of weeks ago the story usually i am practicing in my terrace and it's the same time my neighbor who auntie is making the breakfast for her family 
and when I am doing some breathing in inhale I smell m the masala dosa she is making now immediately my mind can go there and then I start already worrying about masala dosa then sometimes she is mixing nice South Indian degree coffee then immediately I'm also desiring it I stop practice go down to the kitchen and do the coffee for myself and when I drink the coffee I switch on TV oh World Cup cricket match is going on and then I start seeing the match I forget about practice now this is not correct we have to distract we have to distract ourselves from the distractions that is vairagyam distractions should not interfere we have to let go of the distractions that is what is vairagyam but this has many different dimensions because in the spiritual path especially in paths of yoga when you start doing practices the when you go towards the yoga states already many different siddhis start to come many different benefits start to come when you practice yoga it's a sarvanga sadhana so you are not only going towards a goal other things are changing your body becomes good your digestion becomes good your perception becomes good many powers as patanjali explains siddhis start to happen suddenly you start to get all these siddhis pratibha shravana vedana adarsha aswada varta jayante in the third chapter he is saying pratibha you get insight intuition you can see into another person you can know what they are feeling you can know what is going to happen you get this insight shravana you can hear very distant sounds very subtle sounds vedana you can sense very very refined senses adarsha you can see very long you can see very close usually we cannot see very long we cannot see very close but the senses become so refined aswada your taste taste becomes so refined varta smell becomes very refined many powers start to come but patanjali warns us in the sutras he warns us these are distractions <clears throat> these are distractions te samadaha upasargaha vyuthane siddhayaha for the person who is really seeking samadhi who is seeking chitta vritti nirodha even these are distractions you have to let go of that you yourself will become greater and greater in your capacity body's capacity will increase mind's capacity will increase and when the mind capacity increases body capacity increases you can do great things don't get distracted even from that even from that we have to have vairagyam that is why abhyasa and vairagya are presented it's also very important because unless we have detachment there is also not the knowledge patanjali uh, bhagavad gita talks about this patanjali also talks about this because sometimes we don't have detachment from some ideas say i have a fixed idea about some reality that this is how it is this is how it is i'm not detached from that idea then we don't have real knowledge because this idea becomes blinding in tamil we say one statement we say that the rabbit that i have has only three legs now the rabbit may have four legs and it's visible but in my mind i am so convinced that it has only three legs i am so attached to that idea when i am so attached to that idea i don't see reality i have to let go of that fixed idea to see reality and very often this is what happens to us gnanam is very often coming from smriti and samskara memory and patterns the way we are trained to see something that becomes knowledge for us that becomes knowledge we are used to seeing some things a certain way that becomes established as reality but is that reality patanjali is asking us to reflect about it is that really reality or is it only a way of perception so vairagyam is also very important because if we want to have clarity 
you need to have some amount of detachment from fixed ideas as well. We cannot be stubborn. So that is why they go hand in hand, Abhyasa and Vairagya. And usually you will see that in our practice, Abhyasa is giving strength to Vairagyam. The more you practice with the heart, clarifying it with the heart, the more the Vairagyam becomes possible. And usually Vairagyam is the method of testing someone's Abhyasa. My father always used to say, if you want to test somebody's practice, test their Vairagyam. Don't test their practice. Don't test how long they can stay in headstand. See what is what the headstand has done for their Vairagyam. Do they have Vairagyam? Yes or no? Check that. Then automatically you will know about their practice. <clears throat> vairagyam is the test for Abhyasa. Abhyasa is not the test for Abhyasa. That's why Patanjali is presenting both in very intricate way and they are both related to each other because often Abhyasa is the mechanism through which you are able to have a stronger Vairagyam and Vairagyam is the test for Abhyasam. Having said that, the million dollar question is what do we start with first? Is it Abhyasa or Vairagya? What should we start with? Now here again each person will have to find out what is the starting point for each of them. And that is why the guidance of the teacher is essential because for some people Vairagyam is more easier as a starting point. For some people Abhyasam is more easy as a starting point. And so we will have to <coughs> manage that somehow we have to start with one and you will notice that the moment you start with one, very soon the other will also start to be in place because if the bird has to fly, it needs both wings. So ideally it is best if we can start with both, but if not, we have to make a choice based on what is possible for us, what is within our capacity and then we have to move forward. If we do not do the two together, then we will stay in the same place. If we do not do, if, it, if the bird is not flapping both wings, it does not fly. It is not going forward. It goes maybe round and round, maybe it does not even take off. So it is stagnant. The same thing will happen if we are doing Abhyasa only, but we are not developing Vairagyam, then we are stagnant. The same way, if we have a lot of Vairagyam, but we do not practice, then again we are stagnant in the same place. So that is why Patanjali says Abhyasa Vairagya Abhyam Tan Nirodaha. And soon he will elaborate more and more about what is Abhyasa, what is Vairagyam because he wants to present this from the point of view of yoga. What is it that is going to take us towards Chitta Vritti Nirodaha? So, in this simple way, this is the ideas about what is Abhyasam, what is Vairagyam and what, how they two, the two are important step towards reaching Chitta Vritti Nirodha. And you can say that Abhyasa and Vairagya are, are basically the fundamental mechanisms through which we can go closer to the state of yoga or state of Chitta Vritti Nirodha.